All right, not exactly Goodbye Horses, but a pretty good tune. A little Joe Cocker out of the gate. We love it. Overdrive off and running. TSN 1050 on the TSN app, your home smart speaker. Up on TSN 4, Brian Azio, Doug Jeff O'Neill, Jamie Noodles, McLennan. How we feeling on a beautiful Thursday afternoon? What a day Damn. last night, Hazy. What a day for Canada hockey. Huh? The NHL in Canada. And I thought we could do a little thing today. If you have a comment you want to send in, maybe use the hashtag it's one game but and follow up with your thought. It's one game but. Yes, I, I think that can apply to a number of different teams and a Ooh. number of different individual <laughs> players, I would say. Oh, um, yeah. I told you that, though, right? Well, yeah, you <laughs> did in terms of um, I'm sure in Edmonton they're not overly happy and there's some – I wouldn't suggest panic. There shouldn't be. It's one game. You have 81 games left. But on the flip side, you know, if you want to look at Edmonton, that's one thing. If you're in Vancouver, man, what a start for the Vancouver Canucks. Thatcher Demko's a stud. Patterson's a beast. Besser's going to score 70. Yep. No, Not 328. They're already starting with that. Up right. There. If there's one guy that you kind of got to feel good for, it's like we don't really have any association with any of the players. But you see Brock Besser who's been through a lot, and it was just like to see that guy, the happiness, like that was a nice thing to see. Yes, it was, and you're right. Remember him Him yeah. as, a, as a rookie, was he was so good. He was getting called the next Brett Hall, oh, and yeah. then, you know, he ran into some injuries. He obviously had some personal stuff come up, and he looked great last night. And as for this, the scene in Toronto, um, a win is a win is a win, night one. Right. It's always a little bit different. It's always got a bit of a different vibe. And I thought it was a thoroughly entertaining hockey game. How could you not? It it had everything you wanted. Hits, fights, some animosity, some great goals, some great individual play. Um, Obviously, it goes to a shootout. I know not everyone loves that. And I'd be the first one to admit I'd prefer another five minutes of three on three. But um, the big cat. I mean, that's three in a tank, right? We talked about it yesterday. That's <laughs> AC, three in I a think tank. you said yesterday, and I'll kind of give you props, because this preseason, I think you've had some crazy comments, some negative takes, but you saying yesterday you think he's going to regain form as the world's best goal scorer, you must have puffed your chest out pretty high last night. I did. <laughs> and, and to clarify, I never yeah. thought he lost that moniker. I know, he had a down year last year. And yeah. McDavid scored, what, 64 last year? And Pasta hit 60. And Robertson was scoring. And Drysaddle scores. And Ovi has been the man for a long time. But I think, it, I think right. the baton was passed from Ovechkin to Matthews like three or four years ago. And if you look at what he does five on five – the amount of high danger shots, um, something was off last year. Like it, it didn't break his way. He never felt like he was in a in a position to truly dominate. Um, and for him to start the way he started last night, that's three totally different goals. Um, the fact that he scores the last two to tie it and go to overtime. That that building had been asleep basically all night, and then he finally. Uh, I've been saying this for years. You know, we've all been down there. We've all. Oh, you and I, we used to go to the gardens. We've been going to right. ACC, Scotia Bank, Noodles. You played in that building. You've been there countless times recently as a fan. Nothing gets that place rocking. Like, like an Austin like Matthews an big Austin goal. Austin Matthews big goal. And that's what well, he supplied it, last night. He did. Now, I was asked this today. None of his were even strength last night, right? Those don't. Do the six on five count as even strength goals? I don't think they do. That's do a they? good question because they weren't. It wasn't a power play. But you're right. They did have the advantage. You know, it was a six on five. All three of his goals were with the man advantage. I I guess. But I think the empty netter is counted as even strength. I'm not 100%, but it's like, what are you you calling it? It's it's not a penalty. It's even strength. You took your goal. But isn't there there a column for six on five? Like I thought there was. I, there could be noodles. I'm not. I'm not going to rain on the parade of the guys scoring. Well, I'm not trying to rain night. on parade. We were talking about it. You were talking about even strength, and I was like, I, none of them were at even strength. Like okay. I don't think they were. So he's were not they? the best five on five goal scorer in the oh, league. Oh no, no, I, he I, is. I will I, rescind I, that because it was six on five <laughs> last night. No, it was a conversation I had this morning with like it, uh, those even strength goals, and I was like, I, I did. I don't know if they're even strength. I guess you're right. Yeah, you're right. They. Did. I mean, I, to O's point, I, it I'm was, not trying to rain on it. It was six on six on the ice. 
right? It was not like yes. it was not six on five on the ice if you include the goalie for Montreal. But they did have an advantage. They pulled the goalie. I will say after the first one to make it five four, I was like, why are you pulling him again? There's three and a half minutes left. Put him back in. Pull him with like a minute to go. Um, but that's the analytics, right? I'll bet Dude, you Shapiro I, and Atkins yeah. were loving I, that last no, night. I will say, man, yeah. the pulling the goalie, because we were sitting in the room, and it's like the goalie's out with four and a half left. And I'm like, this kind of seems corny. But when you pull it off, you look pretty smart. Well, and and listen, I wasn't trying to rain it. I just was trying to look at the stats. And you know what? Like, you're right. It's six players on six. So it technically would be even strength. It's just the six are different, right? Right. I don't know. You, you're yeah. on to something, Noodles, because it was certainly an advantage. But um, it was – well, just, it was, it was, a was good awesome, night. and you know what? It was a he, fun dra- night. he dragged them. He dragged them to a win. Yes, because I didn't like I, their goal. Inter- their goalie was no good, and I didn't think their D were really good either. No, and I, I, I thought Austin Matthews and the star players dragged them to a win. I Bottom agree with line. you. I thought he had a great. I thought Willie had a great night. I thought Neilander was man. dancing, man. Damn, he, damn good. Yep. He looked good, and I yep. will say, I thought the best player on the ice last night was that Kirby Doc kid. He he was outstanding last night. Like Kirby Doc. He he looked really really good, and if you're in Montreal, that's probably what you're going to see a lot this year, right? Is there? It's going to get away from them. They had ample opportunities to close. Caulfield makes it yeah. three nothing. Then it gets pulled back on a on a review, which kind of saved the Leafs and put them in a position where they could get back into the game. But Caulfield was doing what he was doing. Doc did what he did. New Hook was pretty good last night. Dude, I thought the kid Slavkovsky was good. Too. He was that's pretty the best good. game I've seen yeah. him play. Yes. You know what? It was perfect for both organizations, don't you think? Like the like the development in in tough games, but the Leafs they needed the two points because they they want to go where they need to go. And and Montreal, this was about growth. And I I I thought it was a thoroughly entertaining entertaining yes. game. Oh, I yeah. said oh, and I talked on the phone this morning. I thought it was a great game. I like, thought so noodles. Too. I, th- I, I think so you too. guys could both agree. Noodles, both coaches. At practice today, I don't think either one of them would be pissed off. Like, sometimes you're like game one. It doesn't take long for the coach to be pissed. But Marty St. Louis is probably going to practice thinking, at least we got something out of it. We got a point out of it. We showed some fight. There's some details we can work on. But I think both coaches went to the rink today probably not in a pissed off mood, which is a win-win for entertainment last night. I think you're right. It, it, It probably should be the case across the board, game one for all 32 teams. But that's not ooh, going ooh, ooh. to be the case no, because of the no, way no, no. some games play out. But you're right. I mean, and Sheldon Keefe kind of said somewhat in jest, like, what do you take out of this game? Well, we got two points. And it's yeah. night one. It's a weird energy. I thought, you know, there was a lot of focus on Frazier Minton going into the game. He looked nervous to me. Like, he looked yeah. he looked like he just kind of blended into the game. Um, that's I'm not overreacting. I'm not suggesting he should be going back to the WHL today. I think this is where they have to have a plan, and I would guess it's a five-game plan. Like, Mm -hmm. he deserves five games. Let him show that he's not nervous. Let him show that he's still in the flow of things. And if he does that, he'll remain here. If not, they'll they'll possibly go in a different direction. Um, But I'm with you. I think both coaches probably wake wake up this morning and say, hey, three points were handed out. Two went to the home team, the team with higher expectations this year. Um, yep. But it had goals, it had comebacks, it had hits, it had fights. That Jack guy is a beast, man. That Arbor Jack guy, he is tough as nails. Dude, and that he is guy, looking yeah. for trouble. <laughs> looking for trouble. <laughs> He's got How an was attitude. that guy? Yes. Was, like, was he like undrafted or <laughs> yes. something? That, yes. I, that is insane how teams, and maybe they were. How was everyone? But. It looks like he's more comfortable skating, moving the puck. I saw him on the power play yes. a couple of times. The guy wants to fight Ryan Reeves, wears a stud suit to the game. I'm like, <laughs> how in the hell was there not the Vinny LeCavalier hotel lineup trying to get that cat? Am I missing something That's, with that guy? It's a great question because he was free. He's from Hamilton. Free. And he played yeah. in Kitchener. There is a team that is closer to Kitchener, Ontario than Montreal. And I think we all know the name of it. And for whatever wow. reason, and it's not like the Leafs were the only team. Other teams could have had him too. But the Habs stepped in and said, we'll sign this kid. Why not? And, um, you know, he's he's going to be a third-pairing guy. But Dude, I don't care what he is. He's a thing. He's a big he's, part he's of the team. He's got a presence. He's got a presence. Yeah. Yeah, you for know sure. what, though, guys? Isn't there a story about him working at Costco? Like, yes, during with the, his parents, uh, I believe. 
Yeah, he was working at Costco in like stocking or something during the pandemic. Yes. Like that's and all of a sudden he came out like this is a great story for him because he is. I, I hope that he continues his projection like as a player. And you're right. Ends up a five, six. But, you know, a good player, hard to play against because he's got balls, man. Like yes. and I, I, I love the way he played. I liked looking at both teams last night and seeing Montreal's future and seeing the now of the Leafs. And then going, okay, they could, you know, you could do a little bit there. And same thing with the Leafs. You could do a little bit here. I'd like to see a little bit more there. But, man, I, I, I told you guys this yesterday. It doesn't matter when, where these guys are in the standings. They give us a good game. And they did. That yeah. was a great game last night. Yeah, I they loved did. it. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It, was a, it was a thoroughly entertaining game. And, you know, you, you look at, at where they go now. They got a day off today, you know, day off tomorrow. Minnesota in town on Saturday. Um, and you know, I think if you're the Leafs, you're, you're happy. You just found a way to get two points. Like that's ultimately what your plan is. Game one of 82. They need to sharpen things up. Undoubtedly. I'm sure they will as this season goes on. In fact, I know they will. Um, but it's a weird night opening night and the fans, it you is know, like, it's always weird. I've told you that hazy. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And it's, it's such a, it's a big ticket. It's an expensive ticket. It's a very corporate ticket. You know, that that's what you saw last night. And yeah, like I heard, I was on the way home listening to to Joe Bowen and Jimmy Ralph, who are still phenomenal. Like, not that I need to be the one to say that, but listening to Bonesy and Ralphie, like it just sounds right. They're still doing their thing. Bonesy's still killing it. Ralphie's killing it. And and Joe, you know, he started the broadcast by saying, "What is going on with the fans in this building?" And he stopped himself short and just said, all right, let's move on and let's get off, you know, the schneid here and drop were the they puck. Not, and were they not in their seats or something? It was just quiet. It was quiet. It was routine. Yeah. And there's a history of that. And it's the that's the nature of the beast when you're talking expensive seats, opening night, a lot of corporate stuff. That's what you get. But, you know, it's night one. You're, you're calling the players out. You got new blood in here. You got Domi coming out, Reeves coming out, Bertuzzi coming out. Matthews just signed. And it just, yeah, it's it never that crazy. And it's just not going to be, you know, it just. The only thing I found weird like guys skating out on the ice in that building is skating out after the first period. And I never really thought much of it as a visiting player, but at, when, when you're on the home team and you go out and like in kind of a big game or whatever, and at the start of a period, the whole lower bowl is empty. I always found that weird. Yeah. And I know they've tried yeah. to make some adjustments. You can't go outside and blow darts, blah, blah, blah. I don't know if it helps that much. It's just weird to say, like when I go to a sport event, you guys know this, I'm sitting my ass down in the seat and I'm going to, I'm going to watch the game. I, I don't know. I don't know where else you would go. What are you doing? Yeah. Where are you? It's beers. Wow. It's tracking where other people are, going to meet people, you know, and that's that's what it is. It is you know what? You're, it's disappointing, but in the end, they're going to be in their seats at, at, at the critical times. Right. And, and, you know, you're, you're right. Like, it, that that building, the game built up. Because at 3 Cobb, you're like, oh, this is – I think even, I don't know, whoever runs Overdrive account sent out that little furry bear looking over or whatever, like – Going, okay, what's going on here? <laughs> Whoever and runs then, our account, what do you think? It's like hackers out of I, Russia or something? I don't know. I it's don't know the graph. It yeah, I feel the like the producers all have it. But like at 3 nothing, they send the furry bear looking out. I'm like, all right, relax. And then yeah. they call it back, and then Noah Gregor scores, and then you're off to the races. It's all good. But it was like, I'll tell you what, man. The building got going. Is, it yeah, did get the, going. It did get going. The goaltending is going to be a theme, I think, throughout the show. That, that Noah goal or Gregor goal. That, that can't go in, man. And that Matthews won the, the first one to, to get yeah. it within one. It's like, sorry, Jake Allen. Like, you can't let that in. Like, Marty St. Louis got to be saying, I can go through some X's and O's, and we let it slip away. But that Noah Gregor goal can't go in. Yep. Great shot, whatever you want to say. That wrist shot from that guy cannot go in the yeah. net. And they got to be looking at their goaltender saying, dude, we need a save there. No questions yeah. asked. There, there were two times, you're right, oh, the two ones you just pointed out, because they were at critical times. Think about it. You, you're up 2 nothing. You just had a goal called away, and then Gregor comes down the wall, and, and credit to the kid. Speed down the wall, shoot in stride, but you can't allow that goal. Okay, no so way, 2-1, no, no problem. No way, no way. And then the extra attacker, like, 
give credit to Matthews too. He looks him off and rolls his wrist, but it's like you can't allow that goal from there. Like you, you just can't. Like, but that makes it five four, and now it's on. Now they're now the Leafs know they're coming back. You just knew it. At 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 five three, you're like, okay, pull the goalie through four and a half minutes left. But that goal, as soon as he scored, I'm like, they're tying this up. They had plenty of time to do it. I I thought it was an aggressive second pull at three and a half too, but mm-hmm. it but it was you could see Guy Boucher in the ear of of Sheldon Keep, like just double down, let's do this, and and they did it. It was an aggressive move, good on them. But you're right. There were two goals by by Allen that weren't very good. And I'll be honest, I didn't think there were some. No, Samsonov like, I was not Samsonov great. Samsonov didn't. He was no, not. He, he was not. He looked off kilter. I guys. feel like this happens every single year to start the season. Goaltenders are a bit sloppy. The defensive plays sloppy. You know, the the yep. story of of the day in the NHL is what happened in Vancouver last night. And that's a worst case scenario if you're Edmonton, where. You know, Woodcroft plays these games, you know, wait until we get to the game to see who's playing. All right, Jay, let's see who you got. Oh, it's Jack Campbell, and he got shelled last night. And then yeah. Skinner goes in cold, and he got shelled. And it got away from them and got to the point where they were getting embarrassed, you know, and, and like McDavid eight wasn't one. overly happy eight after two. the game. Yeah, he won. And with the PP1 still out there late and, you know, Demko kind of coming in and coming out and, um, it was it was an embarrassing situation for Edmonton, but I think that flares up probably the concerns there, the concerns in Toronto, right? There's a number of really yep. good teams that if you were to look into a uh, crystal ball and say, all right, this is what ends up clipping you in the end, it's Dude, probably the goaltending yeah, position. I was just going to say, Hazy, going back to the hashtag that potentially we use throughout the day, it's one game, but mm. there are some teams that might think they might be able to slip by with something, a deficiency in their lineup. And there was one game, but they're, they're going to have to fix it before the playoffs or they're going to go down by it. And it's not a question. Goaltending in L.A., maybe goaltending in Edmonton, mm-hmm. defense core in Toronto. I, like They got it done last night, but if, if you think that's going to go the distance – it's just not it's not going to happen. Right. And with the well, cap, everyone's you, got deficiencies, but we'll see what they do about it. I, I I went through the league last night. You're right. L.A. didn't like their goaltender's performance. Ottawa didn't like I didn't think Corpus oh, was no. very good. I was watching that game along with. The, so there's there's two Edmonton, three Toronto, four. That's what I can see off the top of my head. Uh, of goaltenders, you know, Winnipeg, Calgary. I, I thought Winnipeg outplayed Calgary. I thought Markstrom was great. So good on him. Like, that's a good storyline coming up. But that's a four-pack of teams that have a lot of different expectations, but high expectations of going, it's one game, but. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, like I say, Samsonov, I didn't love his preseason. No. I didn't think he was particularly sharp in the preseason, I, and he wasn't sharp last night. I'm not worried about it because – the Leafs did exactly what they're capable of doing. They outscored their issues last night. And that's really, you got two points and you move on, you throw the tape out and you go, okay, we got Minnesota in here on Saturday. Well, but and that's, you, that's what Edmonton's going to yep, do go too, right? Edmonton's going to do the same right. thing. Edmonton's not going, they're, they're, they will respond on Saturday. I believe it's Vancouver, yeah. Edmonton. I wouldn't be shocked if McDavid has a monster night. Dreisaitl has a monster night. Um, and I think L.A. is is well-built and pretty sound, basically top to bottom, that they'll be able to rectify those issues too. There is a difference, though. Toronto, Edmonton, L.A., like perennial playoff teams, high-caliber teams, teams that legitimately feel like they can chase a cup, in Ottawa, who needs to make the playoffs. Yep. And if you know, in order for them to get there, they are going to need Corpus Allo to do something for them. Like, they, they invested yep. in him greatly. They, they paid him a lot of money and gave him a lot of term. Yeah, it's and, their second goal yeah. around doing it too. Right, they gave it, was, it to Matt Murray originally, and that we all know what happened there. Exactly, they're still paying him, right? They're still, I believe, right. even though he's on long-term IR in Toronto, the cap it still applies yeah. in Ottawa, which is wild. One year, yeah. yeah, one year. So it just, but you're you're right, like the expectations. But you know, I was thinking about last night before I went to bed. I'm like, okay, this was a great. We call it opening night, even though it's second night. But I'm like, there's some storylines, spicy, today, oh, yeah. which was great. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what? Like, the fact is, like, and and you're right. Good on Brock Besser. Like him awesome. scoring four. I just, I, I was so happy for him. And you know what? This Vancouver team again won game, but they looked like they had it together last night. Even though Edmonton looked out to lunch, it just like they looked like they had 
a lot of structure, a lot of – they were having fun out there, which, mm-hmm. of course, in a blowout you're going to. But their top players looked like top players. And that Demko made some really good saves early on in that mm-hmm. game that changed what it looked like. So, um, you know what? Good good on them and that – you know, good on Besser because, oh, you're right. Like he – you know, losing his father, what he's gone through the last couple of years, like it's just uh, – you know, I hope that he just hits the ground running, and he did four goals, man. That yeah, four goals is uh, quite the start. And, you know, again, Vancouver's in a similar spot when you talk about that goaltending position where I think they need Demko to carry them to the yep. playoffs, you know, and, and he didn't have to do that last night, but he's going to have to be elite. And if he is, then all bets are off, right? Like the goaltending position yep. can make or break a lot of different teams in this league. Um, yeah, a lot of people are already writing in. It's one game. But um, I like it, Hazy. We yeah. can do it after 10, 20, 30, all the way to 80. All right. Let's uh, keep I, them I, coming. I love it. I say we do it at, at five, though. One game, five games, 10, because five is, is enough to kind of see what you're never working know. with. You know never what I mean? Know. Never know. Never leave that up to Hazy. <laughs> we'll leave that one up to Hazy. A lot of, of hazy. options. <laughs> at Hayes TSN on Twitter, at Overdrive1050 on Twitter. It's one game, but. Hashtag, we'll hashtag, it's one game, but. Hashtag, it's one game, <laughs> never but. Know. You never know. <laughs> and all through Canada. You got a little nugget about something through Canada. Bring it on. Let's yeah. go with it. Let's see, right? They got seven games, Whoa. seven teams, seven different results, I guess, depending on which way you want to look at it last night. So uh, we'll touch on that throughout the afternoon. We've got... Um, not Jason Strudwick today. I know a lot of people are disappointed with that. Oh, man. I thought that was 4.05 p.m. We thought about it. We thought about it. But it was too, too easy, obvious. and it's too You gutless. think it's too easy? <laughs> I, I, You know, Keith texted me this morning, and I, he goes, I'm not asking for Struddy, even no. though I was, like, kind of expecting it. But I, I actually think if we cold called him, he would be expecting it. Oh, I'm you sure he's think, sitting there waiting it, for it. I, I was going to well, tweet I, at I was, him last night, and I let it go. Yeah, I was texting with him last night, just uh, you know, watching the game, going, "This is, you know, what, what is going on What would you have tweeted here? him last night? Like, I, I was thinking some sarcastic combination of his handle, the overdrive handle. Hope you have time for us tomorrow. You know, something, oh. something like that. Once the Leafs closed, and it, within 25 minutes, the Oilers game was basically over. Right from the end of yeah. the Leaf game to the Vancouver Edmonton game. It ended quickly out there. Um, Big start for the Canucks. No question. Um, All right. Steve Phillips coming up as well. Ray will join us though. Ray Ferraro at uh, five o'clock, just after five. Ray's been doing the Connor Bedard tour. He scored a goal last night, uh, but the Bruins end up winning that game. So we got Ray coming up in uh, about 45 minutes. Steve Phillips will join us though. Mark Shapiro. He spoke earlier this morning. It did not take him long to mention the word renovation. We'll play some of the tape. Oh, we'll get a couple of clips. A couple of clips we're going to break down, and we'll see what Steve had to say about the answers. Maybe we got, maybe we didn't get from Shapiro earlier today. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 4. Overdrive continues. Brought to you by FanDuel. Bringing you everything from the opening line of the final score. Thursday night football tonight. Kansas City at home against Denver. Who picks? I have to pick this game. Oh, oh. I almost <laughs> wouldn't want it. I, I mean, don't want it. I don't. I hate these big spread, short week, divisional rivals. Like it just, you know, Kelsey's banged up. He's going to play because Taylor Swift apparently is going to the game. Come so on, she'll no. be there, which means he's going to play. Um, but it's just, I'm going to end up probably taking Kansas City. We'll do it later. In a couple hours, Luke will be in here. How do you bet on Denver like how can you possibly look at Sean Payton and that disaster and say yeah I'll uh, I'll take the points dude they got beat by the Jets yes and they had 70 put up on them by the Dolphins mm-hmm. they suck yeah. they're awful they're horrible um, but it's my game and I'm gonna have to pick it um, Hazy, just one question on the Broncos like why don't they just cut the quarterback why don't they just release them and, and just cut cut ties and say, no, thanks, man. Like, you're paying Russ all that money. Can you just cut bait or no? Or it's, is there just a bunch of guaranteed money? It's a ton of guaranteed money. That That's happening anyway. But if this continues to go the way it's going, he's out of there at the end of the year. They'll cut him yeah. or they'll try to trade him or something. He will not continue to be the quarterback because what they're going to do is completely tear it down. They'll completely strip it down. Have at, to. 
Yeah, they have to. They're doing it anyway. Even with Russ, they're one of the worst teams in football. <laughs> That's the ultimate insult. If you think you have a good team and you're tearing it down just by playing, that's when you've got a mess on your hands, dude. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> we got high hopes this year. Yeah, the five least weeks. did that for a bunch of years. It was yeah. like, we, wow, we got a great. No, no, you're going to tank. And, and you're going to tank thinking you're yeah. making the playoffs. Yeah, without intention. Like it's yes. an unintentional tank. There's it's nothing the worst more thing in sports. Nothing more embarrassing than an unintentional tank. <laughs> it's the worst thing you could do. Yeah, we think we got a great team. Super Bowl's on the horizon. Yeah. Actually, we're tanking after five weeks. Yeah, it's a tough it's a tough interview when you're the GM of something like that. At the beginning of the year, you're like, we better be in the playoffs. And then you're in last place with a so-called quality squad, and you're interviewed at Christmas. It's just, what are you going to say about that? No, I know. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. And that's, that's when you got to be a politician, right? you got to go to the school of Mark Shapiro because Mark's one of the best at it. Mark's wow. been doing it for 30 years. He, there's no ums, there's no ha's, there's no stumbles. It's concise. It's on pace. I got to give him credit. Like the guy, he puts forth a very impressive press conference. Um, it wasn't going to do anything to alleviate, I think, the disappointment of the fan base. But he gave himself five days to let it breathe after Ross Atkins did what he did, said what he said. And when he determined Atkins and Schneider were coming back, like we said yesterday, he was going to walk in here and pump their tires. Yeah, like he hey, wasn't yeah. going to throw them under the bus, and he did. Ultimately, didn't. we we lose our minds as a fan base, as a market. But when you really break it down, you know, we're calling for people's heads. Like you know, they hate Atkins, they hate Shapiro. But what else could you basically do? You could kind of clear the air and straighten out whatever happened in that game. The communication, blah blah blah. But all you can say is, we're, we got to get better, and that's mm. what we're going to do. And then two weeks later, people forget about it. They get into hockey, and then spring training, they're all fired up again. What else are you going to do? Uh, that's Well, yeah. what he could have done was make changes, but he's not. This will be n year nine of Shapiro and Atkins. Nine seasons with yeah. them at, uh, in, in the fall. That's a long time, but he didn't do it. He's not going to do it. You're right. The dust will settle, and they're going to try to win next year. And the only way you can really rectify these issues is by doing so, is have a good offseason and try right. to win. Um, I found it funny, and we'll play this quick clip quickly before Steve joins us. Steve Phillips here in a moment. Because a lot has been made of, you know, the analytics, the nerds in the front office punching numbers and then coming up with a game plan. Right. This was a savvy play by Shapiro because he decided to use Don Mattingly as a shield Today, when he was asked about oh. the Barrios to Kikuchi, and Mattingly had a mustache, he's blue collar, Mr. Baseball, he hates numbers, right? Like, that's his reputation. Obviously, he has progressed with time. But this is what Mark Shapiro had to say a little bit earlier today about his chat. Just a run of the mill, totally random conversation with Don Mattingly on the way back to Toronto. I was in Schneid's office uh, the day after we got eliminated when we flew home with Don Mattingly, with Schneid and with Ross. And, and Don Mattingly said he was kind of miffed at, you know, the reaction to, to the game planning um, and the preparation. He said our planning and preparation was identical for that game as it was for the 162 games during the season. The process wasn't any different. What, what a move. Talking about, what a move. Don what, Mattingly. When, when else did you have Kikuchi ready to rock in game 54? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. After It's just a dumb comment. It, it's not, now I'm mad again. Now well, I'm mad again. <laughs> but it's it, it was a planned play because Donnie Baseball is a blue-collar, beer-drinking, mustache guy. And it's like, well, hey, if you're a blue-collar, truck-driving, you know, Donnie Analytic Baseball hater. would have said, we had a great team and we bleeped that up, is right. what he would have said. But he's using Donnie Baseball as a shield. No. Don't look at us. Don't look at us. Right. Go talk to Don Mattingly. Now I'm mad again. Go talk now to I'm Don mad. Mattingly. Here's Steve Phillips, our TSN MLB analyst. What do you think Don Mattingly thinks about that comment by Shapiro today? <laughs> well, I think he, I think, I don't think he's going to think anything bad about it. I think he knows that he said it and. Uh, and, and look, there's there's the difference, and they're missing the point. It's not a matter of the, the process is part of it, and, so, and that's what Ross got caught up in. Ross Atkins got caught up in is is he thought everybody was worked out because they thought the front office was dictating the move. Now that's one of the issues. The other one was the actual move itself. 
Uh, and and then it come, came down to the process and the explanation of the whole thing. So, yeah, you know, they, they have a plan. But I think clearly Ross and, and Mark Shapiro both knew the plan uh, and what it was going to be. And that's one of the things that, that Ross sort of just didn't say he didn't know the plan at the time. So he was surprised by it. Then he said the players all knew the plan was at some point we might bring in Kikuchi uh, for Barrios to flip the lineup around. And so I'm assuming he knew it too. Now, you know, what Shapiro relayed was that he knew that that was a potential strategy that they could use. When they would use it and implement it, he wasn't sure, and they'd have to wait and see as the, the part of the game to do it. And I think that from Ross's comment, I think that probably both Shapiro and Atkins were surprised when Schneider was making that move. I don't believe that, that you know, Shapiro was like, oh, yeah, now's the time. Uh, and Atkins is surprised by the timing. So, you know, I, I think Shapiro did a much better job of cleaning it up uh, <clears throat> and being like, more accurate and precise and not getting caught up in being defensive of trying to play defense on what people are asking and just say what actually the plan is, what the process is, and what happened in the whole process. Still, so, Steve, you think everybody's kind of – the fan base was pissed after Ross spoke. I mean, what do you think would have cleared this up for the fan base where they said, you know what – Tough luck. Let's go get him next year. Or and when you're in that position, whether you're the GM, the president, is there anything you could say that can actually calm the masses after that mess that happened in Minnesota? Right. So I think what you do is you go and clean it up, and and because you know Ross you know, made everybody have more questions than answers when he had his press conference. So I think he at least answered the questions. He verified the process and Mattingly saying that this is how we've always done it. Okay, that's one thing. I think the bigger, you know, the, the, the after that, it comes down to who, whose opinion does it change? And that, that nobody's opinion, right? You can't unring the bell when it comes to this perception. You know, the fans, uh, and maybe even some of the players have a perception of the front office, and it is what it is. They can explain, you know, their view, and it can be completely accurate from their reality. It's completely their reality. I believe it. Uh, but it's not going to change the perception of the fans. And the only thing that will will be winning a World Series, maybe getting to a World Series, but probably winning a World Series, I think would probably allow the fans to look at the front office differently. Short of that, I think they're going to have some level of doubt and, and uncertainty and, and level of distrust for, for guys who, quite honestly, like Mark Shapiro is as good a guy as you're going to find out there. Ross is a really nice guy. Ross does not have the same uh, ability to, to navigate you know, the, answer, the questions and answers the way that Shapiro does. Uh, and, you know, they, they should have done a better job. So out of this, Ross needs to be better prepared before he addresses the media. Two, uh, John Snyder and his staff cannot be left on their own to devise the tactics necessarily based upon the, the, um, the information that he's given because he really implemented it in completely the wrong context. Now, you don't want to over-micromanage him, but I think you have to ask questions on the front end and make sure he feels comfortable Make a decision you think is right for you and not that you're trying to satisfy what you think somebody else is doing. And if you think you're, you don't, if you're not sure what the front office thinks, ask the question so that you can actually get an answer. Because like he made a decision based on what he thought the front office wanted or thought he should do and not necessarily what they did want him to do. Okay, with that in mind, he was asked multiple times, Shapiro, about communication, right? Communicating in, in the first first time he talked about it was about the, the Barrios to Kikuchi decision. Basically, like letting players know this is why it happened, how it happened. Maybe they can be prepared because he was asked about, you know, the discontent after the game in the clubhouse. But then later on in his presser, he was asked about, you know, helping the team in terms of producing runs, in terms of how they run the bases um, and maybe communicating a, a game plan or a strategy or getting information to the players that they can utilize on the field. I thought this was an interesting answer he gave. Let's play it. We'll come back and get into it. What has been clear in talking to Ross over the last week and in him kind of, you know, doing some reflection and talking to a lot of our players is that we had probably made some assumption that there was a clarity to the people, um, to the planning and preparation that goes into our games. I think that what has come to light is both from the information and the planning, by the way, which is, is, was, a, was designed by and led by John Schneider, 
Um, but we have to be more clear with our players, more transparent, do a better job of communicating um, what that process is. And, and then most importantly, if there's a line of demarcation when it comes into the game that the decisions lie with our staff and with John. So that I find very interesting, Steve. That's him basically saying we want the players to believe, and I don't think they will in 2023, soon to be 2024. John Schneider makes all the calls. Like he said it multiple times there. And it, specifically, if there's a line of demarcation, John makes that call. I, I'm not buying it. And I don't think any modern day player will. And we heard that from yeah. players after the game. Well, they said yeah, that wasn't right. John Schneider's call. Like, so who's he kidding with a comment like that? Yeah. So, but here's the thing. There's a narrative out there around the game that front offices write up lineups for the manager. They tell them what to do. They map out the strategy beforehand and everything else. And I think the one thing that Ross Atkins and Mark Shapiro made clear is they're not doing it exactly like that. They're not doing it like other organizations. Now, they are responsible, and this is where Shapiro took responsibility and not Atkins, uh, that they're responsible for the, the information that's being developed and passed down to the manager. They have the ultimate responsibility for that. They also need to assume some responsibility where Ross didn't really do it for Schneider, that if Schneider is misinterpreting information or, or using it in a way that, that uh, is out of context, then they've got to figure out why that is. And that's an organizational flaw. It's not a John Schneider flaw in his decision-making. Uh, I, 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 th- I take them at their word that they are not dictating to Don, John Schneider what moves to make. Now, they are giving him information. And within that information, like here's the thing. My owners never told me to go sign a specific player. But you know what they told me? If you want that player, you've got some extra room in your budget for him. Uh, or you don't have any money in your budget for that guy. They didn't pick the player. But they, they told me who I could get and who I couldn't get just by a different way of doing it, so they have plausible deniability. I, don't, I think that Mark Shapiro is as honest a guy as, as I'm going to find. And I think that Ross got caught up looking disingenuous because he was being very defensive about the notion that they're controlling the decision-making for, for uh, John Snyder. I think that, that it's probably not as uh, controlled by the front office in Toronto as you might, might think, and as it might be in other places. But I do think they're in control of some of the information that's going down there. And when that information goes down there, I think there's an intent behind it that John Snyder should follow it. And so, you know, it's, it's one that, that is not clear. It's very ambiguous. Uh, it allows wiggle room for everybody, and they've got to clean it up. And the players automatically assume that John Snyder is being told what to do from the front office. And that's a bit of an indictment of John Snyder, and it's a bit of an indictment on the front office. I think it's really damning on both fronts uh, that Snyder would allow himself to be manipulated in some way or controlled or that the front office would want to control him. I think that, 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 that fact needs to be cleared up for the players to understand exactly what's going on. Steve, I just want to clarify too, just from the outside, you've been a baseball lifer. You know, I'm sure you know John Schneider. I'm sure you know everybody involved in this situation. So if there wasn't coaching down from above, do you believe that is it possible that John Schneider just played a hunch on that situation and it just went wrong? Yeah, I do. I think he had, I think, here's what I think. I think that he had a plan that they thought was a great plan. We're going to make the twins flip their lineup around and we're going to get their left-handed hitters out of the game, which are their better guys. And then we'll have better matchups late in the game with our right-handed pitchers going against their right-handed hitters. Great. I think that I think that and that was clear for both Ross and for Mark Shapiro and clearly for John Snyder. That was one of the things they wanted to try to do. Uh, you know, when they were going to do it, seems to be some level of confusion as to was it where was it discussed, when was it discussed? Because he chose a really bad time, and it seemed to me that his desire he was so caught up in this brilliant move to flip the other lineup. Right, bring in your left-handed pitcher, make them pinch hit the right-handed bats for the left-handed bats, or maybe they're not quite as good. Now, what they also didn't understand is that Matt Kikuchi was going to have to pitch to Correa, left-handed pitcher for a right-handed hitter, and it would make Correa a better hitter. Right, So their logic was flawed in a number of different ways, and the timing was flawed too. But I do believe that this is mostly on John Snyder implementing a plan and a strategy uh, that – you know, I get the idea of it, but you don't just do it to do it. It's got to fit the context of the game. And I think Snyder, I, I put more of this on John Snyder than I do anybody else. The decision, I do. I think this was him making a decision. Uh, and, and what I put on the front office is 
that that you don't dictate. But if he felt compelled to have to do it because he thought that everybody wanted him to do it, then there's a mistake in the communication or he's managing afraid of his job where he wants to please the bosses instead of doing the right thing in the game. And, I, and that's unclear right now. And that's the stuff they need to get cleared up moving forward. Yet immediately well, he's back, right? Like it just – it doesn't – like something doesn't add up there. Well, right? Hazy, a couple things with that, with that comment, Steve – if that is the case, why didn't he have the stones after the game to say, you know what, I took a chance, it didn't work out. Like, have some like have some self-respect as a manager to say, you know what, I screwed that up. And secondly, the comments after the game were, you got a bunch of different people involved in decision-making and you're trying to make everyone happy. Why would he make those comments as opposed to just saying, that was my call and I screwed it up or it ultimately yeah. didn't work out? Yeah, yeah, no, you're, you're right. I Look, Ross... And, and John Snyder have some cleaning up to do in their relationship. And, and, and Mark Shapiro was asked that, right? Because he said it's, it would cr- seem to create some level of awkwardness because Snyder sent, seemed, seemed like he was putting it on. He indicated, he implied, he inferred that maybe he was being controlled and dictated, uh, that this was something he felt like he had to satisfy people above him. On the other side, it, Ross was very clear. I had nothing to do with it. You know, we, we have his staff, but it's what he wants, and he looks at the information, and he does it. Uh, and so either way, it's either, it's either Schneider ducked and tried to, to defuse the blame by putting it on the organization, uh, or Ross threw him under the bus. My thought is more that, that Schneider did not answer the question pro- properly. Now, Ross should have protected him. If you're going to bring him back, you protect him. Uh, and, you know, what Mark Shapiro effectively said today is, that these are not fireable mistakes, that people are going to make mistakes, right? And so he was asked about Ross and the trade for Barso, for Moreno and, and Guriel, and he goes, yeah, you can't look at everything as isolated because, you know, what about Belt? What about, uh, you know, the trade for Merrifield? What about, uh, you know, the other signings that we've made? Those all seem to really work out well with Bassett and, and uh, people we brought in in, in Swanson and so you know, you look at it and think, okay, well, sure, there, and every general manager is going to have some trades that didn't work out exactly the way you had hoped or free agent signing that might not work out that way. But generally, how does the roster look? And, and so, you know, he's looking at it thinking there were a lot more positives than negatives, and clearly there are some things that need to get cleaned up, right? I mean, the whole Anthony Bass stuff during the season, the Noah situation during the course of the season, you know, there seemed to be some lack of communication there, at least, you know, seemingly from the Noah side of it all. Uh, and, um, but I think that he's looking at thinking we made the playoffs three of the last four years. And, you know, the point I would make is if you let them go, say you let Schneider go and you let Ross Atkins go, and you're going to bring in a new manager and general manager. And I were to tell you, you're going to give a four year contract to that new crew and they're going to get you to the playoffs in three of the four years, uh, and give you a chance to, to get to the playoffs and have a chance to go to a world series. Would you sign up for it? If the answer is yes then you can't really let the guys go that you have because that's just what they did is get you to the playoffs in three of the last four years. Yeah. Now, one of them was a COVID year. They were 30 and 30. They got smoked. You know, there's some semantics there, but um, we'll see. You know, and ultimately the answers have, have been supplied. It's, it's going to be Shapiro into Atkins into Schneider, and it's going to be a fun off season, and we'll do it again down the road. Thank you, Steve. You bet, guys. I'm sorry I couldn't satisfy you more with uh, my answers to it. Yes, it happens sometimes. It happens sometimes. We'll keep you accountable, Steve. I can tell. I can tell. I can feel the energy on this. I can tell. (laughs) Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. All right, guys. See you. You Steve Phillips, our TSN MLB analyst. Love Steve. And uh, baseball playoffs continue. Your boy Bryce Harper is a stud. Philly man, he is something else. And dude, I told you that guy, like he was always looked at as a spoiled, like mm-hmm. baseball kid who got the massive contract. That guy's just a flat out stud. End of yeah. story. Yeah, flat out. So is Gaby Marino, right? Like that. That dude. one. Shapiro said you got to wait four or five years, right? By that yeah. point, For he'll what? be. He'll be. For Kirk to continue to grow. Wow, that's literally? the issue. That's the issue is that they they kept Kirk who had a horrible season. Dude, think about this. Like if you talk bombs. about it, you, you talk about a yeah. tweak offensively that could have been a, because small t- tweaks sometimes are big factors in the whole vibe of an offense. So if you you put in Guriel and Teoscar Hernandez and maybe this Moreno kid, maybe their offense looks completely different. That's 
very yeah. legitimate. And at a minimum, if you're gonna if you're gonna trade Marino, you got to get better than what Dalton Varsho supplied. Right, like that's really the tipping point. It's not so much what Marino is going to turn into. They knew what he was going to turn into. If Varsho plays like he did this year, next year, it's one of the worst trades yeah, in franchise that's a, history. That's a fireball offense. Immediately, it's <laughs> it's immediately labeled that. All right, it's race coming up in 15 minutes. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 4. John tweeting in at Hayes TSN asking, "Do you think the Marino trade will go down as bad as the Tuka Rask trade?" Well, I, I can neither confirm or deny that. <laughs> Dude, it might. Kind of similar. Kirk is pogey. Oh, wow. You know, Marino is Rask. I hope not. But you know what might be the better analogy to use is Yaroslav Halak, Carey Price. Remember Halak had that monster year, great playoffs playoff against run. St. Louis. Yep. Exactly. And it seemed like they were contemplating for a second. For a second. Then they said, what are we doing? We have Carey <laughs> Price coming. Obviously, we're keeping him and we're going to move off Halak. Instead, the Jays were like, we got Marino coming, but we'll trade him and we're going to keep Alejandro Kirk. And, and Kirk's yeah. still young. He had a down year. He had a very good year the year before. He, he's, he gets a chance to redeem himself. Like he, he does get that chance, and we'll see what comes of it. But not the best, right? No, it's not ugly. It's ugly. Best. Not the best. Yeah. Not the best. <laughs> All right, Ray Ferraro coming up. Ray's taking the Leaf game last night. What happened in Vancouver last night? And he's seen Bedard up close and personal. How good is this kid? At 18 years old, Ray Ferraro joins us next.